Hello and welcome to this Royal Society videocast. I'm Wendy Barnaby and today I'll be talking to Professor Uta Frith of the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London and Professor Chris Frith of the Wellcome Centre for Neuroimaging also at University College London. They've written a paper in the 350th anniversary issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B. The paper is about the biological basis of human interaction and it's called The Social Brain, Allowing Humans to Boldly Go Where No Other Species Has Been. So, Chris, Uta, can I ask you first of all to explain why it's so important for us to understand what's going on in our brains when we're interacting with each other? Well, I think there are at least three reasons, but the first reason is that if you think about it in evolutionary terms, the, what's special about the human brain and what makes us different from other animals is our incredible abilities at social interaction. And we would argue that that's mostly what the human brain is for, and that's what makes it different from chimpanzees or orangutans and so on. And therefore, from a purely academic point of view, this is the exciting thing to look at in the human brain because it's there and we don't know how it works. And psychologists in particular have tended to ignore the studies of social interactions and look at things like problem solving or playing chess, which don't really address this at all. Many of the um, disorders of the mind um, have to do with a, an impairment of social interactions and it would be very important to understand uh, the the basis of this and not only just to understand how the breakdown can occur but also maybe to find some treatment eventually and naturally to be very ambitious we would love to be able to use all the knowledge that will eventually be accumulated in the field to solve real life conflicts. Just to set the scene a little more there are two main um, theories, if you like, which are enormously important here, aren't there? One is the theory of mind and the other is to do with with uh, mirroring. Could you just explain those briefly to, to set the, the scene? Yes, I mean, mirror neurons are of great interest to people studying the social brain and they were actually discovered relatively recently by Rizzolatti's group in Italy and a mirror neuron at least in the monkey, is a neuron which fires when the monkey does something like picking up a peanut. And that is indeed how they, what they were studying at the time, was simply motor behaviour. And they found that the same neuron would fire if the monkey saw the experiment of picking up a peanut. So it's specific to a different particular kinds of actions, but it responds both to the self and to the other making the same action. And this indicates that they're at a that there must be a mechanism in the brain that solves the problem of relating what you do to what you see. Because this is actually quite a difficult problem, particularly in relation to the face. How do I know, by looking at you when you smile, how I should actually create a smile? Because I have to go from vision to muscle activity. It's called the correspondence problem. Now, since that discovery, everybody's been very interested in this. And um, in humans, you get essentially the same thing happening. When you see someone moving, activity appears in the bits of your brain that are concerned with movement. But it, what has also been found in humans is that you have exactly the same mirroring for emotions. So if I, as I said, if I see you smile, I will automatically smile in response. If I see someone in pain, my pain areas light up. If I see someone being touched, it, it is, my brain responds as if I had been touched, although I'm not aware of this. So there's all this mirroring going on. And amongst other things, it provides a, a sort of basis for a primitive kind of empathy where we actually feel the emotions of other people. And some people have gone a bit overboard about this and say, well, mirror neurons can explain everything about human interactions because they enable you to read minds, but we don't quite agree with this. And this is where the mind reading part of the story. So we think that perhaps is quite a separate system that um, deals with the... Um, ability to actually distinguish between what we ourselves see and experience and know and what other people 
see and experience and know. So it's a kind of understanding that different perspectives are possible of the same thing. And it's it's a very pervasive ability. It's so taken for granted by all of us that it's actually hardly ever been talked about in psychology until about the um, late 70s. And even then, people said, well, this is just a very complex um, ability. You make inferences, you perceive, you do things, and you have got all your experience. But then it turns out that perhaps um, there is a network, a dedicated network in the brain that underlies this pervasive tendency that we have to attribute psychological motivations to ourselves and to other people so that we predict behavior not on the basis of reality of what actually happens but on the basis of people's mental state. We touched on it a little bit there but these systems of communication are set in motion by deliberate signals and voluntary signals. Can you tell me about those just so that we can understand really what's going on here? Well, that's very interesting. As we, we, the, this is relates to the mirror neuron story or the general mirror system story. So, as I said, when you, if I see someone moving, I almost automatically move myself. And indeed, when people are having an interaction and not having to hold microphones and things, you get something called the chameleon effect, whereby the two people start imitating each other unconsciously, crossing their legs at the same time, touching their noses or whatever it may be. And wicked social psychologists have shown that if one of them is actually a stooge who is told to imitate, the person who is imitated thinks they are nicer, friendlier, easier, have better rapport with compared to a person who doesn't imitate them. And not only that, after the interaction, if you've been imitated, you're more likely to give money to charity. So there's this extraordinary implicit system going on because of these signals and it's the same with emo expressions of emotion and so on so this is an example of the unconscious cues at work if you are aware that the other person is imitating you um, then you will be suddenly very upset you understand that this is mocking and this is not right so as soon as you are conscious of these signals uh, completely different systems respond and you really will then uh, use your theory of mind uh, ideas as to what on earth can be going on. You will no doubt think that you're being manipulated here and be very cross. Um, one of these signals you refer to as an eyebrow flash. Can you show me what that is? <laughs> so that would make me sit up and take notice, as indeed yes, it does. Yes. What about other conscious triggers then that... Um, well, we are uh, we are using uh, ostensive gestures all the time. I mean, I, you you can see me do do this. Uh, usually, I do it not deliberately at all. But I think if I, for example, want to give a lecture, I will wish um, people to attend to me, and uh, I would wish them to think that I have something interesting to say something that they don't already know so we have various signals for doing this and this is this is the kind of um, extremely subtle and important uh, stuff that makes uh, teaching possible but also you know every communication is actually based on this ostention on this deliberate use of some gestures it could be just a direct look or name but I was going to say what's very interesting is the pointing gesture, which is a very obvious ostensive gesture which even young children have, is apparently not used in chimpanzees. This is claimed as a uniquely human gesture to, in, to share attention with somebody else. You say that we're based towards cooperative behaviour. Um, you have this rather optimistic view of human nature, it seems to me. I mean, as far as you're concerned, life is not nasty, brutish and short. But... We must have similarly complex situations controlling aggressive behaviour as well, I would have thought. So why are you sure that the cooperative systems are more important? I guess I'm not really. I mean, there's some newer work which I don't think we talked about in that paper, but there's very good evidence that within our group we are extremely cooperative and the mere presence of other people makes us more cooperative. But there's beginning to be studies showing that this is only true for the in-group. So for example, if we go back to empathy for pain, if I see someone having a needle stuck into their face, like my pain areas light up, but somebody's just done a study in China where they had Caucasian subjects and Chinese subjects looking at Caucasian people and Chinese people, and the empathy only happens for the same 
race. So if I'm a Caucasian and I see a needle go into a Chinese face, there's no response. And this is at a very automatic level. So all this niceness is about the in-group. And of course there's a theory which people, have, I mean evolutionary theorists have developed about the development of altruism. This depends upon group conflict. So you cannot, suggestion may be that you cannot have altruism developing in the absence, unless you have conflict with other groups. So there is a dark side. What advantage do you think this knowledge might give us in practical situations? You did talk before about helping us to solve social conflicts. The we have we've sort of touched we've talked about there being a low level automatic system and a higher level conscious system, and to some extent the higher level conscious system can override the responses of the low level automatic system. And once again this is neutral, this could be used for good or it could be used for bad. But in the case of the race prejudice I was just talking about, or at least which the basis of race prejudice, there's evidence from New York, for example, that if you see a black face very briefly, amygdala lights up, suggesting that you're slightly frightened about this. And this relates to unconscious measures of unconscious race prejudice. But if you see it for a longer time, frontal cortex comes in and overrides this and is now reflecting the, your conscious um, wish about whether you should be prejudiced or not. So in this case, your high-level conscious system can actually if, override the low-level system. And there's what I guess I would like to believe is that the more we discover and can see in ourselves these low-level processes acting, the better we are able to control them. Although whether we control them for good or bad is another matter. Well, with that rather sobering ending, thank you very much indeed, Uta and Chris. And thank you for watching. That's all from this Royal Society videocast. We hope you'll join us again.